Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, here's something that I've thought about that's been interesting for a few years. The Trump administration obviously sort of took this hawkish line on China, introduced this tariffs on a lot of Chinese exports to the U.S. And then when uh, the Biden administration took over, it kind of seems like we basically got continuity on that front. There was no rollback. Yeah. If anything, maybe some of the screws have been tightened even further. I think that's exactly right. And it's kind of funny, as you mentioned, that it's flown a little bit under the radar. And I'm thinking back to uh, Trump's statement, trade wars are good and easy to yeah. win. <laughs> and I mean, he got a lot of flack for that, probably rightfully so. But if you think about what's been happening over the past few years, like it seems like the U.S. is kind of winning the trade war against mm. China in some respects. I mean, the U.S. economy uh, outperforming much of the rest of the world. I think GDP growth was something like 3% in 2023. China's GDP growth is still higher. I believe it was at 5%, but it's slowing a lot. And if you look at what's going on with the economy right now, it seems like it is really struggling in various ways. That's interesting that they're winning. I hadn't really well, thought about it. Winning we're, might be winning, strong, but like... Yeah. You, well, you our know. economy is clearly doing better. Yeah. Or at least it appears to. On the other hand, China clearly has a handful of industrial powerhouses yes. that are creating anxiety for legacy industrial powerhouses in the U.S. and uh, Europe. And we can say that clearly when it comes to EV versus legacy automakers. We can look at, you know, the rising number of conversations like a oh, Boeing is faltering. Will Comac and the CN19 mm -hmm. eventually take significant market share in commercial aerospace? We did an episode, I think, near the end of last year that actually, despite all of the restrictions on equipment imports into China for semiconductors, that the domestic semiconductor industry is making gains. So like in the GDP sense of the word, like clearly China is struggling, but on these sort of like key industrial strategic, question, strategic areas of the economy, there is the yeah. word things still seem to be working out. No, absolutely. And I think there is this overall angst in the U.S. with this idea that China is somehow better at yes. doing this kind of targeted industrial policy. We used to talk about the Chinese command economy. They have experience with pouring lots and lots of money into areas that they identify as strategically important. That doesn't mean they do it perfectly right. every time. I mean, we basically saw that with some of the consumer tech companies where there was a reversal of the government stance towards them, lots of talk of disorderly capital flowing into that space. But then what we saw is, you know, they, they said that, they cracked down on the sector, and then they said, what we really want you to invest in is things like solar panels and electric vehicles yeah. and semiconductors. And so we saw those areas start to boom. So I think there is a real sense of concern yes. in the U.S. that maybe China, if they're not better at it, they certainly have done it for a longer time on a more consistent basis. Right. And so it feels like now the debate in the U.S. is like, OK, everyone has sort of accepted that the tariffs that Trump introduced, that the idea that the U.S. in various ways tries to constrain Chinese exports or constrain Chinese industry. It feels like that's become conventional wisdom now or mm. that everyone sort of agrees we do that in Washington. And now the question is how much? And of course, recently we heard Trump say that were he to be elected president, he would ratch up the tariffs even more, I think he put the number like 60%, which he I have did, to imagine would like totally clobber. He did say 60%, yeah. but then I saw right before we came on, let's see, we're recording this on February 8th. I think there was a interview from like February 6th where he basically said that the tariffs could be even bigger yeah. than 60%. So I don't know where he's quite getting those round numbers from, um, but <laughs> maybe more than 60 percent. Right. Who knows? So as much as Biden has been a continuation and extension and an expansion of Trump policies, maybe Trump, uh, if he were to win the presidency in November, would be a continuation and expansion even further. Anyway, we should talk about what a Trump victory, which is, of course, certainly possible, what it would mean for the U.S.-China relationship and what it might look like, what the direction all this is heading. Let's do it. All right. Well, we have two absolutely perfect guests today. We're going to be speaking to Tom Orlick, uh, previous Odd Lots guest multiple times, chief economist for Bloomberg Economics, and Mackenzie Hawkins. She is the U.S. industrial policy reporter for Bloomberg in D.C. Both of them worked on a big new report sort of examining this question, which everyone should go and read. But thankfully, they are taking the time to speak with us. So Tom and Mackenzie, thank you so much for joining us. 
Great to be here. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks for having us on. Actually, Tom, let me just start with you with like the most vague theoretical question there is. From a purely like economist standpoint, what do tariffs do? So tariffs increase the cost of imports. Um, and when the cost goes up, the demand goes down. So in the first Trump administration, um, we saw 25% tariffs on a swathe of Chinese exports to the United States. And we've got a bunch of data on the impact that those tariffs had. Um, so we can kind of say what the impact was. Um, and we're seeing Chinese sales to the US in the categories of goods that face the tariffs down more than $100 billion relative to where they would have been if no tariffs had been put in place. Now here we are at the start of 2024, still a few months to the election, but Donald Trump clearly in the lead for the Republican nomination, running ahead of uh, Joe Biden in the polls in some key swing states, and talking about a 60% tariff on all Chinese imports. Well, if 25% tariffs put a bit of a hole in revenue for Chinese factories, 60% uh, tariffs, I think, would turn that hole into more like a crater. Hmm. So Joe asked a very theoretical question, and I guess I'm going to ask something a little bit more specific. But talk to us about how targeted or I guess customized the tariffs are that we've seen from the Trump administration and then the Biden administration, because, of course, Trump's export curbs did involve semiconductors when he was president. But then Biden came in and I believe he targeted, you know, advanced semiconductor technology and China's access to it. And in some ways, he was even more strategic in the things that he was limiting. So in the Trump administration, you saw this sweeping tariff review that affected a wide range of Chinese industries. And the Biden administration has held those tariffs in place. There's been sort of a quote unquote imminent tariff review for months now. And a big question in Washington is whether the administration will stay the course with the sectors that Trump targeted or have a more refined approach that might focus on key strategic sectors for the U.S. like EVs and other clean energy products, which, of course, the Biden administration is trying to subsidize at home. But then you saw Biden look at a whole suite of other tools of economic statecraft that have actually become his favored mechanisms to get at the Beijing question. One of those, as you said, Tracy, is export controls on advanced semiconductors. These are the critical electronic components that power everything from your phone to your car to nuclear missiles. And there's a big fear in Washington that if China catches up with U.S. technology, that they could use AI to power weapon systems, that it could pose a significant mm. military threat to the U.S. And so you saw in October 2022 sweeping controls on the ability of U.S. companies to export the most advanced semiconductor technology and shipmaking equipment to any Chinese company. Mackenzie, just as a follow up on that specifically and talking about politically, like, as we said in the introduction, and as Tracy just mentioned, you know, Biden continued with a lot of these tariff reviews. They're ongoing. They've become even more targeted. How did this become the consensus that the idea of just dropping tariffs and sort of returning to the pre-Trump status quo with regards to trade now doesn't even seem on the table anymore? And it doesn't seem like anyone advocates for that. How did this just become like the bipartisan consensus that setting aside the degree of restrictions that some restrictions must be applied? It's a great question. You know, when you talk to folks on both sides of the aisle on the Hill, they say the one thing that everyone agrees on is China. And the question is not what, but how much. And, you know, you really saw the Trump administration, you know, early on introduce this tariffs question, and then later on towards the latter years start to target specific Chinese firms. Like a great example is Huawei, the Chinese mm. telecommunications giant, which you saw Trump sanction in 2019 over concerns about the security of their telecommunication systems that are all over the U.S. And then once that sort of entered the Washington think tank sphere and people really started seeing Huawei as a security threat, 
it became, okay, what else is Huawei doing that's a security threat? And, you know, the initial sanctions sort of crippled their telecommunications business and their smartphone business for quite some time. But we saw Huawei debut a smartphone in August that's powered by a chip that's far more advanced than where the U.S. was hoping to hamstring China's rise. And so as we've seen China sort of make incremental technological progress in these areas that Washington has decided it's quite concerned about, there doesn't really seem to be a big debate over whether should we really be doing export controls in the first place? It's we've been on this path. We've seen China continue to make progress. What are additional measures that we can take with our allies to prevent any further progress from these firms that now for five years have been thought of as a significant security threat in D.C.? I just build on that briefly and point to three big factors, which I think have changed the dynamic here in Washington, D.C. and made anti-China into a sort of broad and firm consensus. I think the first thing driving it has been China's sudden rise, right? When everyone was agreeing that China could join the WTO uh, back in 1999, 2000, China's GDP was a fraction of US GDP. China's military capabilities were nowhere near US military capabilities. And so China really wasn't regarded as a threat, and it was still possible to regard China as a kind of almost like a disciple, that's now clearly changed. I think the second thing which is important is the kind of the peculiarities of the US election system, which gives a disproportionate amount of power to the votes and the voices of a constituency in a few swing states, places like Pennsylvania, Mm. which in, in the US Rust Belt, and which have suffered disproportionately from China's rise as a manufacturing power. And so where tough on China is a very popular vote winner. And then I think the third factor, which we have to acknowledge, is the kind of the strange genius of Donald Trump, right, who kind of revealed in his campaign in 2016 that being really tough on China was a powerful motivating factor for the voters in those swing states. Whatever happened to the sort of old simplistic argument for protectionism, which was, well, we want to, you know, reshore manufacturing, create more jobs in the U.S. It feels like it sort of evolved into this very specific anti-China action. Um, And we haven't seen, correct me if I'm wrong, but we certainly haven't seen as stringent actions on other countries and other manufacturing threats. I mean, we know Mexico is exporting tons to the U.S. now, um, sort of filling some of the gap that China has left. But what happened to that argument? That feels like it's lost a little bit of popularity in D.C. Everything feels very strategic, very security focused. Mm. So I think when it comes to China, these two things come together from a U.S. policy perspective rather nicely, right? Here's China, a single party state, a state dominated economy rising quickly, 1.3 billion people. It's easy to see why this is regarded as a national security threat. And so why it's easy to win the argument in D.C. for things like banning sales of leading edge semiconductors because potentially they could fuel uh, China's military capabilities. At the same time, China's enormous success in grabbing global market share in the manufacturing sector and the consequences of that for US manufacturing, where factory towns have been hollowed out and people have lost their jobs, makes the case that this is really important, not just from a national security perspective, but also from a kind of social well-being, allowing everyone to benefit from the the growth of the US economy perspective. So it's a complicated picture. Now, when it comes to China, those national security arguments and those concerns about the hollowing out of the manufacturing sector come together very nicely. Um, The kind of the messiness of it, uh, which I think you were sort of alluding to, Tracy, um, is that nearshoring and friendshoring, that addresses the national security piece of it, but it certainly doesn't help people who lost their manufacturing jobs here in the United States. They're not going to be super delighted to see those jobs 
coming back to Mexico or Vietnam or other places which don't really help them out. And the manufacturing argument still has a lot of salience in D.C. and on the campaign trail. You know, you can think of one tranche of Biden's China policy as sanctions controls on outbound investment, export controls on semiconductor chips and the continuation of Trump tariffs. But you can think of the other side of the coin as the massive industrial policy effort that the U.S. has embarked on over the past couple of years. The Chips and Science Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, which is Democrats' signature climate law, and the bipartisan infrastructure law have poured well over a trillion dollars of federal funding into revitalizing these domestic manufacturing bases in areas that lost a lot of jobs to the so-called China shock. It is true also that I think Trump has talked about doing a blanket 10% tariff on all imports to the U.S., so basically ring-fencing the entire economy. Well, this is uh, dovetails with what I was about to ask next time, and it's sort of another theoretical economics question, kind of like when I asked what tariffs do, but why didn't we have inflation? Why don't they, why weren't Mm. they inflationary in the Trump period? And how do economists think about the inflation risks associated with aggressive tariffs, either on one country or blanket tariffs on everyone? So it's a really good question. Uh, If we think about the kind of the big picture over the last 30 years, globalization and the ability of consumers in the United States to tap cheap goods made in China has been one of the factors that was pretty helpful in keeping inflation around the Fed's 2% target, at least until the post-pandemic inflation surge. Now, why didn't the Trump tariffs have a more significant impact on that dynamic. Um, I think the reason is there's a few factors at work. The first factor is goods inflation is important in the US, but it's not as important as services inflation. Hmm. And services inflation doesn't really get impacted by tariffs that you put on goods. The second factor is, yes, China is a really important supplier of goods to the United States, um, but it's not the only supplier. And then the third factor at work is tariffs aren't the only thing going on. Yes, the Trump administration put 25% tariffs on, but over the same period, we saw a significant depreciation of China's yuan. China's factories were able to absorb some of the shock by taking lower profit margins, and that provided a little bit of an offset. So just on this note, have you done any number crunching on what Trump's proposal would mean for inflation now? Do you have specific numbers? So we have actually been crunching the numbers, uh, Tracy. Uh, And here I want to give a shout out to uh, Eleonora Mavrodi um, in our modeling team in Paris. She's taken a big model of the global economy and she's plugged in that Trump proposal for a 60 percent increase in tariffs uh, on U.S. imports from China. And what the model is telling us is that that has a pretty catastrophic impact on trade. In fact, If the U.S. goes ahead with 60 percent tariffs and China reciprocates with 60 percent tariffs, matching the pattern of kind of tit for tat retaliation we saw during the first Trump term, that pretty much turns off trade between the world's two biggest economies. Mm. The impact on inflation, well, it's there. If import costs go up, then that's a positive impact on inflation, but it's not particularly marked. That's partly for the reasons I was just sharing. Services inflation is more important than goods inflation. It's also because there's an offsetting drag. Import prices go up and that directly affects the CPI, but tariffs also have a depressing effect on growth. And that means the economy is weaker and that's an offset on inflation. If the US and China, these two huge trading partners suddenly stop trading, what other knock on effects do we see from that? So I can speak to the economics of that, and maybe right. Mackenzie has some thoughts on the on the sort of broader policy implications. So on the economics, I think it's interesting to think about this, not just at the aggregate level, but also at the sector level, Yeah, and not just about the impact on the US and China, but also about the impact on other economies around the world. So at the sector level in the United States, it's kind of a policy to support the industries of the past, right? Mining production of steel. These are industries which were crucially important to the United States in an earlier stage of its development. Not so important now. Those would be the industries which would be the main beneficiary of a 60% tariff. Who loses out? Well, it's kind of the industries of the future, right? 
It's the people making the semiconductors. It's the people making the advanced electronics, the people with the exposure to that East Asian electronics supply chain. And thinking about the global impact, well, if we break the trade relationship between China and the United States, that's bad for those two countries. But there are some other countries that could well gain. Thinking about those connector economies, places like Vietnam, places like Mexico, that have a strong manufacturing base, that have low costs, and that have pretty good trade relationships with those two economies. And when you think about the bilateral relationship between Washington and Beijing, at the same time as Biden has become increasingly hawkish on China, employing sort of novel tools of economic statecraft to get at advanced industries in the country, there's also been this significant back channel effort to improve direct diplomatic ties, military to military communications, culminating in a meeting between the two leaders on the sidelines of the APEC summit in San Francisco. And so you can imagine, you know, after establishing formal communication networks between the Treasury Department and their counterparts in China, formal communications networks between the Commerce Department here and MOFCOM in China, the sort of deterioration of a lot of the sort of day to day, slow working diplomatic effort that's been happening under President Biden, if the U.S. were to sort of blow up the trade relationship between the two countries under a potential Trump administration. Mackenzie, you mentioned earlier the Infrastructure Investment Act, and the other big set piece from the Biden administration has been the clean energy transition and the money that is pouring in there. And this is a question that I've asked a couple people on this podcast at this point. But it seems like the U.S. has a desire to shift away from fossil fuels, maybe build up home capacity of clean energy technology like solar panels. But at the same time, it is also very true that China is good at producing lots of cheap solar panels and things like that. So I guess I'm curious what you're hearing from the administration in terms of, I guess, the need to build up or increase some of that capability at home and make it more efficient versus the lower cost and sheer volume of production that you would get from Chinese made renewable technology or even semiconductors? It's a great question. The solar panel question is kind of the most often cited explanation of the danger that China poses to these sort of more nascent industries in the U.S. on hydrogen, on wind, and also on electric vehicles and semiconductor chips where the U.S. was long the technological leader and then ceded a lot of that production capability to East Asia. And so when we think about the sort of critical industries that the U.S. is investing in right now, you identify them right off the bat. It's semiconductor conductor chips, it's electric vehicles, it's solar, wind, hydro, a bunch of types of clean energy through the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. And the worry is that the U.S. could pour significant amounts of government capital, trying to crowd in private capital to build up these industries. But if Chinese firms are not operating in the same market environment, there could be a significant dumping risk. Um, the fear on chips, for example, is that China's been building up capacity in the sort of mature, older generation semiconductors that still power the entire global economy, even if they're not the cutting edge. Those are not the ones that the U.S. is trying to deal with with export controls. And that's why the Biden administration is talking about tariffs. They say we see this following the same trajectory that we saw with solar panels and on electric vehicles as well. The U.S. is pouring billions of dollars in trying to get American auto giants to build cleaner cars in the U.S. But Chinese models are on offer for less than half the cost. And the only reason they haven't entered U.S. markets yet or the primary reason is that there's a 27.5 percent tariff imposed under Donald Trump. And you're hearing a lot of concern in Washington. Maybe we might need to increase that number to protect these industries that we're investing in so much at home. I'm glad you went there. That was literally going to be what I asked, because when you talk about the Chinese EV boom, most of the people talk about the European market specifically and how it's a threat to you know, BMW and the various legacy automakers. But in theory, right, like if the quality continues to improve, if they continue to go down like the sort of learning 
cost curve of cost. Like, is it only a matter of time at current rates before we start seeing BYD cars in the U.S. competing against, you know, obviously Tesla, but also the EV efforts of the Detroit Free and others that so far haven't gone all that great as far as I can tell? So that is one of the central questions I think the policymakers in the administration are thinking about right now. You know, the EV question in the U.S. is manifold. One, there is concern that Chinese EV supply chain companies will try to take advantage of the tax credits offered for U.S. production. There's been a lot of focus, for example, on this Ford facility in Michigan, which has a licensing agreement with cattle, which is the preeminent global battery maker. And a lot of China hawks on the Hill, you know, in some cases on both sides of the aisle are saying we should really keep a close eye on that. Is this sort of an attempt by China to work around restrictions that say you can't take advantage of the tax credits if you have a certain threshold of Chinese investment in your supply chain to sort of tap into this Inflation Reduction Act fueled EV boom in the United States? Then there's the question of Will BYD and other Chinese companies try to invest in Mexico? You know, you saw Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen in December on a trip to Mexico City saying, we want to help Mexico fortify against, you know, foreign investment threats, including specifically China. Hmm. And Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo last week sort of opened the door to a little bit of a novel take on Chinese EVs coming from the administration, citing data security risks. So not even just talking about the market dynamics and the trade threat, which was the logic behind the Trump tariffs to begin with, and this sort of long going conversation among Biden officials about whether to adjust or potentially increase those tariffs, but also the question of you know, these cars are equipped with thousands of sensors. And she asked the question, do we really want all of that data going to Beijing? And so that was almost seeding the floor a little bit to maybe this quote unquote, small yard, high fence approach that the Biden administration has touted for years is becoming or could become a slightly larger yard and higher fence looking at other forms of critical technologies that compared to sort of the market risks that Tom was talking about earlier that fueled sort of the traditional U.S.-China trade battle, now we're thinking about information technology that lends a national security argument to some of these same products. So just thinking about things that have changed since the Trump years, 2016 to 2020, one of the big things has to be Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And I guess the sort of economic alliance that we've seen between China and Russia emerged since then. And I'm wondering, we've obviously been focused a lot on the U.S.-China relationship specifically, but could we potentially see the emergence of, for lack of a better term, east-west trade blocks? I think that's a really interesting question, Tracy. And it sort of reminds me of the kind of the miscalculation that many here in the United States made about the impact of U.S. sanctions and European sanctions on Russia in the days after Putin's tanks rolled across the border into Ukraine. You remember back two years ago, there was sweeping sanctions, right? Russia essentially locked out of the dollar financial market. Russian firms, with some exceptions in energy, essentially locked out of trade with the US and Europe. And at that moment, there was a rush to sort of call the collapse of the Russian economy, right? The US is sanctioning them. Europe is sanctioning them. They can't participate in the global financial system. This must be the first moment of a crisis. And in fact, two years on, we can see that these sanctions and these controls have certainly had a negative impact on Russia, but it's certainly not tipped them into crisis. Why is that? Well, I think the unfortunate reality for policymakers here in DC and in Brussels is that they no longer have the same impact that they once did. And the reason for that is because of China and, to a lesser extent, India, which has also maintained more or less normal trading relations with Russia. And so what that suggests is that as China rises and as India rises and other major emerging markets, which don't necessarily fall into line with DC, start playing a bigger role in the global economy, the capacity of the United States and its allies to shape outcomes for particular countries by imposing sanctions or tariffs becomes that much less. And to your question, Tracy, yes, that possibility of an east-west trade block is very much there. 
bad for global growth, but a buffer for countries that find themselves at the wrong end of U.S. economic statecraft. And China's alignment with Russia has actually lent a lot more credence to U.S. arguments about the national security risks that a lot of European allies have been lukewarm on for some time. So, you know, they've seen China as a market opportunity, not necessarily the geopolitical threat that Washington sees. But they've started to pay more attention to U.S. warnings, particularly about the risk of invasion of Taiwan, since they felt this pressure from Russia and then the alignment between those two powers. And, you know, the, one of the best examples of this is in order for the U.S. to restrict China's access to advanced semiconductors, they had to get key allies with key companies in the supply chain on board. One of the best examples is ASML, the leading maker of chip making equipment, uh, which is based in the Netherlands. And if the U.S. is going to prevent China from developing advanced chips, they have to convince the Dutch government to block ASML from sending the most high tech machines over to China. And so this sort of increasing threat from Russia where a company like ASML might say, we want to trade. China's a fantastic customer. China just became sort of proportionally the largest share of ASML sales just a a month or two ago. The alignment between China and Russia has sort of helped bring European powers around to the idea that no, China does pose a significant risk. If they invade Taiwan, which houses the world's preeminent chip maker, where we get all of the most advanced chips that power all of our most advanced technology, that is a threat that we need your alignment on. Tom, I know when trade deals are crafted, when people think about tariffs, the actual country of origin for a given good is always people try to figure that out essentially so that the, you you know, if we want to restrict Chinese exports to the U.S., that they can't just like land in Mexico first and, uh, you know, then cross the border and say it's a Mexican good. But we do know that imports into the U.S. from Mexico have been uh, surging. And as you mentioned, Mexico could be a beneficiary if there were a cutoff. Like how leaky is that? And to what degree can other countries, other destinations be de facto? Yes, we're importing from Mexico, but really this is a continuation of importing from China. Yeah, it's a really good question, Joe. Uh, it reminds me of a funny moment uh, in, a, in a Chinese novel I read a few years ago, uh, Xiongdi or Brothers. And there's a moment in the novel where there's a kind of rise in anti-Japanese sentiment in China. And there's a, a violent mob that goes out and tries to smash Japanese products. And they're on the cusp of smashing what they think is a Japanese car. And one of the characters says, wait, this car was made of the joint venture enterprise in, in China. <laughs> And then another protagonist says, "Okay, let's just smash half of it. (laughs) Um, And and I think that's kind of like that's the reality of global trade. Right. I mean, the the sort of the classic example is the iPhone technology and branding here in the United States. Semiconductors from Taiwan snaps together in mainland China. If there's going to be a trade war, which bit of it are you going to impact? Right. Well, the reality is that you can't impact one bit of it without impacting another. We're seeing some of that complexity playing out in different ways in in the years since the Trump tariffs came into place. Uh, We're seeing Chinese companies setting up shop in Vietnam, Chinese companies attempting to set up shop in Mexico. So they'd be exporting from those countries to the United States, dodging the Trump tariffs. But where does the revenue go? In many cases, still going to those Chinese firms. It's a complex system. And that makes it that much harder to wield these tools of economic statecraft without creating some unintended collateral damage. And there's always the question of how deep in the supply chain are you going to go when you think about chips or you think about EVs down to the raw components, the minerals. I mean, China has been snapping up mines across the world. And if you say we don't want any Chinese investment anywhere in the supply chain for any of the goods that we're going to subsidize or even allow to be imported into the U.S., you could end up with zero goods at all. Hmm. So on the one hand, we have Trump running on this idea of 60 percent tariffs on China, maybe more, plus perhaps a 10 percent ring fence on all imports into America. On the other hand, you have the Biden administration, which is already in office and has already continued some quite stringent restrictions on China. When you talk to policymakers in China or when you look at surveys of the domestic Chinese population, what do they say about Mm. their preferred candidate? Do they express Mm -hmm. a preference? 
So we cite a survey in our story, an online survey figured out, trying to figure out how the Chinese public feels about the upcoming U.S. vote. And about 60 percent of the respondents preferred Trump. But it wasn't that, you know, his China plans stack up better for them against Biden's, but they thought that he would ease the pressure on China by bringing chaos to America. <laughs> <sighs> well, we'll see what happens. Mackenzie and Tom, thank you so much for coming on. Fascinating work. Everyone should go read your Big Take article out on the Bloomberg now. And um, we'll have to have you both back on Odd Lot. Maybe uh, after the November election. We'll see what happens. Thanks so much for having us. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, Tracy. Tracy, I thought that was great. There was a lot interesting in there. One thing that I'll pick out that was sort of something Mackenzie said about um, even as these economic constraints have grown, Mm. there has been some other progress, like military to military communication, treasury to treasury communication. It reminds me of something, you know, we talked to Adam Posen at Jackson. And that was one of his concerns about trade wars, which is that trade freedom doesn't necessarily lead to peace, but trade constraints can create geopolitical problems. Right. Which makes a lot of sense. Well, on that note, the other thing that both of them really emphasized was this idea of China sort of in a sweet spot for this kind of trade restriction Mm -hmm. where you do have concerns over the loss of jobs and manufacturing that have been going on for decades. But then on the other hand, you do have the strategic concerns, strategically important industries. Is the U.S. going to be able to compete on semiconductors or clean energy tech and also that military aspect of it? So it sort of makes sense why the U.S. would focus on China and why it's politically appealing. Totally. Can I express an unpopular opinion? I don't know if it's unpopular. I just don't hear many people say it. I really believe that if there's, you know, if there's one country in the world that could do true like autarky, like it's obviously the U.S. Right. Like, for, like it would probably be very economically harmful to literally no longer trade with the world. Just to be clear, you are not recommending I'm this not as recommending a policy, but as a thought as, experiment. But as a thought experiment, if there's one place yeah. that has all the food, all of the minerals, all of the oil, all of the natural gas, all of the talented companies, all of the high tech. Like if there's one place that I think could plausibly pull it off, it's clearly the U.S. So like, again, this is not me making a policy recommendation. I just think like <laughs> I think we could it would be very disruptive and I'm not in favor, but I think we could survive. It. Someone is going to take that quote completely <laughs> out of context yeah. and uh, tweet it. Well, the one other thing I was thinking, and it's a shame we didn't get into this, but maybe we should do an episode more related to this uh, down the road. But I never quite figured out Trump's policy on currency because he oh, seemed yeah. to switch or vary between wanting a strong <laughs> dollar because it sounds good yeah, to have yeah. a strong dollar, but then also wanting a weak dollar to because boost it's good exports. For exports. You know, that's very funny because, right, like strong dollar, it sounds very Trumpy. Right. But he also had some like intuitions that it wasn't quite right. And even I remember once on the campaign trail, he said something to the effect of like, yeah, I like want a weak dollar. It's good for borrowing. It's good for exports. It's one of those things where like it's counterintuitive, but also makes sense. But yeah. It's not rhetoric. No one rhetorically wants to come out for a weak dollar, but it it's a, yeah, it's he a never funny quite one. made up yeah. his mind. Uh, well, maybe someone will ask him about that on the campaign trail. Maybe he'll come on odd lots yeah. and talk about his currency policy. All right. In the meantime, shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me at The Stalwart. Follow our guest, Mackenzie Hawkins. She's at Matt Hawk. Follow Tom Orlick at Tom Orlick. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin, Dash O'Bennett at Dashbot, and Kale Brooks at Kale Brooks. Thank you to our producer, Moses Andam. For more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we have a blog, transcripts, and a newsletter. And check out the Discord, discord.gg slash Odd Lots, where you can chat with fellow listeners 24-7. And if you enjoy Odd Lots, if you like it when we examine the Trump and Biden tariffs, then please leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. And don't forget, if you are a Bloomberg subscriber, you can listen to all of our episodes absolutely ad free. Just connect your Bloomberg subscription to Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. 